The Lord be with you. And also with you. Amen. Uh, just a quick note. I'm asking you to continue to pray for me and my wife. And I will explain to you very quickly exactly what I'm praying for, and you can join me. I'm praying that my wife and I will hear the Spirit in the same voice. Until she and I are hearing the same voice, how do I know which one is the Spirit? So that's what we're praying for, okay? So I have a, a hopefully a, a conversation this afternoon scheduled with her. Maybe there's some clarity there, and then uh, if not, we'll just keep sniffing it out. All right. Anyway, uh, you have some important news. Good morning. It is my pleasure to be able to invite all the ladies of the congregation to the uh, Sisters in Christ Tea, which takes place on uh, April 20th from 2 to 4 in the afternoon. We have fellowship, we have great food, and there will be some surprises. So something to look forward to. And I can tell you, if you don't make it, you really will be sorry you missed it. It's such a lot of fun. The other thing that I need to tell you this morning, Lily asked me to let you know that we need greeters to sign up for late service in particular uh, the, the rest of this month and for greeters uh, for the following months. So if you're a greeter, please don't forget to sign up. Thank you. the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness.
Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are, by nature, sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 The Lord be with you. Let us pray, Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may, by your grace, confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. We ask it through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and always. Amen. Please be seated.
the first reading for this Sunday is from the fourth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles according to Luke. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they were everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. The response of Psalm for the Sunday is Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him from the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him in the highest heavens and in the waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all depths. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. The epistle reading for this Sunday is from the first chapter of John's first letter. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and who was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in his him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sins. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came. And he stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they're forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, he was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and my hands into his side, I'll never believe. Well, eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, to him have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise Jesus. Jesus. We confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Grace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God that engages us in meditation this morning is that first chapter, especially from 1 John. And if you look ahead in the readings, and I know if those of you who participate in the uh, Monday Bible study group, you look ahead in the readings, perhaps you noticed all of the 1 John readings that are coming up in the next couple of weeks. So for about a month, we're, we're going to focus our attention on what John writes in his first epistle. And because of that, I just give you a few introductory comments on, on John and, and, and his epistle. So the John that is the author here of this epistle, 1 John, and there are three John epistles in the, in the Bible, 1 John, 2 John, and you, got, you guessed it, 3 John. Um, all three of these, it's fascinating that the intricacies of the theology there. Um, the, all three of those epistles were written by the exact same person as the man who wrote the gospel according to John. This is at least what is believed uh, based on all the evidence. And then also the same John is the author of the last book in the Bible, Revelation. So that's the person we're, we're listening to, we're reading. He is an eyewitness, a disciple of Jesus. He's in the room when the gospel lesson that I just read, where he shows up and he breathes his spirit on them and, and sends them to be his messengers of the gospel. Uh, he's in the room. He's in the room when, you know, when he's healing and he's in the room when, he's, when Jesus is doing all his stuff. 
John is in the room. In fact, he's so in the room that John writes an entire gospel. Um, And that's uh, actually the gospel reading that you heard today was from John's gospel. And that's where he writes at the end. He he writes, there's a lot more I could tell you about what Jesus did and said among us. There's a lot more I could tell you. I'm not going to write it all down, he says, but I'll tell you why I'm writing this stuff down. I'm writing this stuff down so that you can have saving faith in Jesus Christ. That's the John who wrote the gospel. That's the John who wrote Revelation. And that's the John who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Um, One last little uh, isagogic uh, thought. It is believed by most scholars now that John wrote Revelation first and that he wrote his gospel after he wrote the book of Revelation. Interesting little detail there. And if you read them that way, um, well, I... It, it's fascinating to read them that way, um, to, to see how his revelation maybe impacted his style, his manner of writing his gospel. And that's why the gospel of John is, is not regarded as one of the synoptic gospels because it tells the gospel story in a completely different way than the other three gospel writers who tend to tell the story in a very similar way. Anyway, there you have it. There's a a little bit of uh, details on who John was. And oh, he's also, John is also uh, one of the three disciples that are typically closest to Jesus. Okay? So when he goes up on the mountain of transfiguration, it's Peter, James, and John. And you hear those three names all the time Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. So even among the 12 disciples, Jesus sort of had a little board of elders, and John was on it. And, um, <clears throat> and that John is also the one whom he, uh, John himself refers to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Okay, and in fact, John talks so much about love in his gospel, in Revelation, and throughout his epistles. He talks so much about love, about God as love, that some people just refer to John as the doctor of love. People who are nerdy like me. Um, and nobody you know. So uh, anyway, um, that's, the, uh, that's who, who we're reading today. And uh, so kind of a late first century document by an eyewitness of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what he writes here in that first uh, paragraph, in a sense, of his letter, 1 John, which is a letter to Christians, specifically addressed to Christians. This is designed to be read by people who are inside the Christian church, um, he says he's, he's, what he's laying out in this first paragraph are the basics, the starting point for what it means to be the church. What's the starting point? The, the cover of your bulletin says, starting off right. And that's what John's doing for us. He's saying, here's the basic, most bottom line, most important bedrock foundational understandings of what it means to be a Christian, a, a member of the Christian church. And, uh, and so um, what you'll see, you, what you should expect to see as we look at this uh, paragraph, you should expect to see the kind of doctrine that feels very familiar to you. You, it should feel very, so for instance, if I say, is this Christian doctrine or not? Is, raise your hand if you say this is good Christian doctrine. We are saved by God's grace through faith on account of Jesus Christ. Yes or no? Yes. Most, yeah, good. Okay, good. I assume that if you didn't raise your hand, it's because you're an introvert. Uh, <laughs> you all got that right, see? Um, that was my way of making sure you all got it right. Of course it is, and you're going to see that reflected in the text here, how salvation comes uh, on account of God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, here's, I'm going to start you with an example of someone who communicates one of the most beautiful truths about God, and he communicates it 
in an absolutely wrong way. Such a wrong way that you would say it's false doctrine. But what he's talking about is one of the most beautiful truths that the Bible has to offer. Um, the, the person I'm going to quote was a late 18th century poet and literary critic or philosopher by the name of Heinrich Heine. Heine was his last name. Heinrich Heine. German, obviously, dude. And um, uh, he was a famous poet. His poetry was picked up by Robert Schumann and... Uh, uh, Franz Schubert, who wrote music to his poetry. So he, he was famous even in his own day. Um, he, but he was also famous for living a debauched lifestyle. That means he was naughty. <laughs> a lot. Publicly naughty. And uh, he was asked near his death, he was on his deathbed apparently as the legend goes and a priest asked him, aren't you afraid of meeting God after all that you've done? And he looked at the priest as the legend goes and he said, no, God will forgive me. That's his job. That's his job. Now, do you see how he's, he's taking a stab at one of the most beautiful truths of Scripture? God forgives. But is it God's job to forgive? If it's, if it's his job, then it's an obligation. And if it's an obligation... That's not grace at all. So Heine is missing something in his understanding of God's forgiveness. He's got half right. God will forgive. God is the forgiver. If there's going to be forgiveness, it's got to come from him. But not because he's bound to forgive you. And this is what John, writing 1,700 years earlier, <laughs> gets right. And uh, what John is saying, and again, uh, like this is your reminder that this is the John of the Gospel of John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, looked upon, touched with our hands. That's the story you heard. They touched the resurrected Christ's hands and, and his side. They, they came into physical contact with the reality of the resurrection. They were confronted in that moment that they live in a whole new world, a world where death has been defeated. So that which we looked upon and touched concerning the word of life, um, the life which was made manifest, we testify it, we proclaim it to you as eternal life, which was with the Father, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, and he says all of this, this is what we're proclaiming to you, these basic, basic doctrines of what it means to be a Christian so that you may have fellowship with us. And he says, by the way, about that fellowship, it's fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So, here's what he's laying out before I even tell you what it is that is his message. What he's saying about his message is that the truths that he's communicating, that he says he received firsthand from God himself in the person of Jesus Christ, that which, he's, which has been given to him, which he is now handing over to you, what, what those truths do is to link you together in a fellowship and that fellowship includes not just the people in this room, but all of the people who come into a confession of these truths, it links you with them also, and it links you, by the way, with John himself. It's fellowship with John, and that fellowship that includes, in other words, it includes all of y'all in this room, it includes all of anyone who's ever worshipped in this room, including people who worship in other Christian rooms, including people who are now dead and gone, 
and people not yet born. <laughs> We're all linked together in communion or in fellowship with God the Father and Jesus Christ his Son. This word fellowship, I want you to understand how powerful a word it is. It comes from the Greek word koine, which you maybe know is koinonia. You ever heard that word? So there's, you can hear it at work. It means to have things in common. You heard it in the, uh, uh, in the Acts reading also. They had all things in common. What does that mean? They were in fellowship with one another. Meaning to have fellowship according to what John is proposing here. He's saying this is a fellowship built on a truth. To be in fellowship like this means to receive things as true, to uh, consent to them, to agree with them, to, to, be, con to be in a confessional, and I'll explain that in a second, uh, p position or disposition toward these basic truths. And th those things link you together as one body, the Christian church. And look, it's in that link, that fellowship, which we're calling the Christian church in all times and in all places. That fellowship, which is the Christian church, is where the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. So before I even explain to you the, these two basic truths that John is proposing for us to believe, the claim that he's making about these truths is that they are so powerful that they themselves, these truths, when this, when this truth comes alive in your life, it links you to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It makes him your savior and it puts you in the same fellowship of the redeemed that all Christians over the course of all time have always been linked to. There is one church. And it is the church that confesses what John is teaching in his epistle. There's your introduction. How much time do I have left for the, for the actual sermon? The actual sermon in this case is, is rather short because I wanted to give you a lot of introductory material. Here's what I want you to see that he's actually teaching. Two things. The first is that God is light. It's in verse 5. This is the message, he says. So if you're taking notes and you're wondering what the message is, you get to verse 5, and John says, this is the message. And you go, oh, what's he about to write? This is the message. God is light. So that's point one. And in verse 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Those are the two things that work together to create the Christian church. These are the things that appeal to your faith. All of the other stuff that you want to believe about God or you want to confess about the church or think you understand, all, go for it. Have a real wrestle with the scripture. But here's the thing not to depart from. If you find yourself departing from these two basic things, what John is warning is you depart your, for, from these two basic things. God is light and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses. You depart from those things and you're breaking fellowship with God. That's a thing in the words of Mater from the Cars movie, that's a thing to not to, to not to. Don't do that. Don't break communion with God the Father. All right, so here's what he means. What does it mean that God is light? God is light. God is light. Now, if you track that metaphor, the light metaphor throughout Scripture, which would be the long version of this sermon, I'm giving you the short version, what you end up with is the metaphor for light when it applies to God, the metaphor for light is a reference to his holiness, his perfection, his unique and onlyness. The thing that he is that none, no one or no other thing ever can or will be. He alone is holy. 
So it's the holiness of God that, cr that creates this bedrock for what it means to be a confessing member of the Christian church. I believe that God alone is holy. Now that's a mouthful because it means if you truly understand what the word holiness means, it means you're not. If God is holy, holy means se separate, set apart, unique, alone, uh, uh, on, the, on the pedestal by himself. He is the God of God, the light of lights, very God of very God. His holy, the, your only access to holiness, would all, anyone's holiness, and their access to it can only come from him. He is the only source of holiness in the universe. He is light. Okay? That's a reduction of what the Bible, uh, biblical concept of light is. So you, this, so you have a holy God. Now this creates a problem <clears throat> because God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. And if you've just confessed properly what it means that God is light, if you've just confessed properly or if you've come into an understanding of God, a God alone as holy, the kind of reflexive idea is I'm not holy. If I'm holy and God's holy, then I've got the wrong definition of holy. <laughs> <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm like God in any possible way, it can't be with respect to holiness. So how can it be that confessing that God is holy establishes fellowship with him when it's his holiness that prevents fellowship with him? In him is no darkness. In me is. And in you too. Right? right? Or do I need to remind you what he reminds you? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. So, uh, I mean, look, you can try and get away with I'm holy enough to have fellowship with God but it's not gonna work for you. It turns God into, you're turning God into a liar and you violated his holiness. You're deceiving yourself if you think that. So the conundrum that takes place by confessing that God is light and in him is no darkness at all, the conundrum is how can that possibly lead to fellowship with him when you've just confess the very thing that violates that fellowship. I can't have fellowship with a holy God. I'm not holy. And if there's one thing that's true about holiness, it will burn to a crisp anything that gets anywhere near it that isn't also holy. <laughs> that much we know. Holy, his, God's holiness is dangerous to anything that isn't holy. So how can you have fellowship with God? How can a confession of his holiness lead to to fellowship with him? Well, that's the second point. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses you from sin. And this is where our friend Heinrich Heine got it all wrong. Are you afraid to meet God based on all the things that you've been doing in that life of yours? God will forgive me because the holy and precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ, is for me the propitiation, John uses that word, of my sin. Now, what does that word mean, propitiation? It means that Christ's blood doesn't erase your sin. That would be expiation. This is propitiation. Propitiation means the blood of Christ paid the price for your sin. And that's the answer to the delta between God's holiness and your not holiness. That, that chasm, that delta is gapped by the blood of Jesus Christ. Only by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not by some other confession, some other good work, some other good record, only by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
So what, what, Paul, what, Paul, what John says is, when you confess your sins, you're agreeing with God that he's holy and you're not, and that his blood is your only hope. That word to confess, that's a fascinating word. Um, it's built off of two words, con and fess. The word con means together, with. It's like the word, it's similar to the word koinonia. It's, a, it's a, an agreement. And the word fess means to speak. So when you confess your sins, you're agreeing with God about who he is, and about what you need. That's why these words play such a huge role in our worship service every Sunday morning. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We've broken fellowship. We've broken fellowship with each other. For me to stand here and tell you that I'm without sin, we would, that would break our fellowship. But it also breaks my fellowship with God because I'm disagreeing. Either he's a liar or I'm in the darkness. And if I walk in the darkness, though he is in the light, I am not in fellowship with him. Just quoting John. So to confess, if we, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, but the truth is that, But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I'm going to close with that one phrase because it's the heart and soul of the worship service, right? Not only do those words appear in the worship service, but they're reflected throughout the liturgy. In, when, we, when in our invocation we say, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are, we are invoking the holy name of God. We're acknowledging God's holiness at the beginning of every worship service. That, that invocation of God's name drives us immediately to do something. Confess our sins. Right? Notice that. The, the confession follows the invocation. It's the, it's, the, it's the pronouncement of the presence of the holy God that drives you to say, most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. See? So the very next words after in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. See, see the role that this doctrine plays, it's at the very, very beginning of our worship service. It establishes that we're all in communion with this idea that we are sinners in need of the holy God's blood to, to to, as propitiation for our sins. And so then you hear it reflected in the words of the confession. We are by nature sinful. We've also sinned in thought, word, and deed. That's reflected in what John is saying because John says not only if we say we have no sin, but he also says if, we say, if anyone says that they have not sinned. So John is talking about the, the sinful human nature as well as the sinful human behaviors and so we talk about thought, word, and deed. We talk about justly deserving your present and eternal punishment. That's what Heinrich Heine should have been talking about. If he was cognizant of the holiness of God and his need for the blood of Jesus Christ, he could confess that he justly deserves God's present and eternal punishment. So the priest comes and talks to him and says, aren't you afraid to meet God? And he could say, well, I ought to be because I justly deserve his present and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry, and I sincerely repent. And the blood of Christ, which is the propitiation for not just for your sins, but for the sins of the whole world, cleanses you from all unrighteousness. Um, you can find that language throughout the service. You can, you'll find it in the hymns. You'll find it in the prayers. You'll find it in the liturgy. It's the core basic doctrine. It's getting started right. Now, in the rest of the letter, John's going to be talking to these people who are in communion with one another, in a fellowship, and he's going to start talking to them about how they should behave. And it's important that he gets this first thing right. Because if you start talking to a bunch of Christians about how they behave, they're in, they may be inclined to say, well, I need to behave this way in order to please God. And that would uh, render what I just preached to you invalid, wouldn't it? Because you don't please God. God has been pleased by the blood of his son. 
which cleanses you from all our unrighteousness and creates this fellowship in which we live and move and have our being. Okay? Now, if you agree with me, say amen. Amen. That's fellowship. We stand to pray. Heavenly Father, your Son is the firstborn from the dead. In him we have been reborn into a new and living hope. Nurture us with the pure milk of your word that we may grow to maturity of faith and have everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. Grant to those ordained for your service the gift of the Spirit, wisdom that comes down from above, Grace to faithfully fulfill their holy calling where you have placed them, Lord, in your mercy. As your people are united in the common life and love of our Savior, grant that we would share that life and love with those in need, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Build up the households of your people that we may grow in your grace and share together in your forgiveness and life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You've instituted authorities to carry out your justice, so bless all who make, administer, and judge the laws of our land. Give them wisdom, integrity, and honor to serve according to your good will, Lord, in your mercy. And Father of the risen Christ, you give us the crucified and risen body and blood of our Lord in this holy supper. Let us taste that the Lord is good and continually grow up unto salvation as you continue to teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
The Lord be with you. 